Okay, here we go. So for those of you new to the channel, my name is Mindy Mandel, and we're talking about the Republic today. As you can see, we're into book two. So we ended book one with Socrates having a conversation with a man named Thrasymachus, and they were discussing whether or not justice is a virtue. And uh, Thrasymachus finally dropped the conversation, but he wasn't really convinced by Socrates' arguments. And so he was unsatisfied, and Socrates himself was unsatisfied. He said that they went in the search of whether or not justice is a virtue without yet defining what justice is. And that's where we ended book one, and that's where we pick up book two. So in book two, a man named Glaucon picks up the argument for Thrasymachus. Now, all of our translations for actually throughout all of the Republic, not just this video, but all of the Republic, are from Paul Shorey. Now, the um, actual dialogue is written with um, Socrates as the narrator, and it's not written in usual script form, but I will be presenting quotes that way for um, the ease of presentation, but otherwise I'm sticking strictly to the translation of Paul Shorey. Okay, so we see that Glaucon, who's always an intrepid, enterprising spirit in everything, would not on this occasion acquiesce in Thrasymachus's abandonment of his case. And so Glaucon brings in the idea that we can divide goods into three categories. We can talk about a good which we desire for its own sake, and the examples he gives are joy and harmless pleasures. And then we can also talk about a good which we desire for its own sake, but also for its consequences, such as sight or health. They have benefit in themselves, but also because we can see, we can do things that a person who does not have vision would not be able to do or would have more difficulty doing. Same with good health. We can do things that a more sickly person would not be able to do. And then there's a third category, a good which we desire only for its consequences like curing sickness. Think of like chemotherapy, for example. Nobody enjoys it, but a person who goes through chemotherapy does it for the hope of killing cancer. And most people feel the same way about exercise, that it's not fun in itself. There are people who think it's fun, but uh, we won't talk about them. Most people would agree that exercise is not fun, but we want the desired, we desire the consequences, I should say. Um, we want the appearance of somebody who has muscles or who is in shape, and we want the health benefits. So there are three kinds of goods. And then he asks Socrates, in which of these classes do you place justice? In my opinion, it belongs in the fairest class, that which a man who is to be happy must love both for its own sake and for the result. Now I want to just point out um, for those who are kind of new to my videos that Yes, Plato does use male references throughout all of his dialogues, and it can be annoying for those of us who are not men, but um, we'll just have to, you know, allow him this um, politically incorrect point because he wrote at a very different time. But, of course, everything he says about men also applies to women. All right, so Glaucon says, Yet the multitude do not think so, do not think that justice belongs in that middle class, but they would put it in the toilsome class of things that must be practiced for the sake of rewards and repute due to opinion, but that in itself is to be shunned as an affliction. And Socrates says, I am aware that that is the general opinion, and Thrasymachus has for some time been disparaging it as such and praising injustice. But I, it seems, am somewhat slow to learn. And so Glaucon complains that the case for justice, to prove that it is better than injustice, I've never yet heard stated by any as I desire to hear it. What I desire is to hear an encomium on justice in and by itself. And I think I am most likely to get that from you, Socrates. So Glaucon is going to run through a rather long explanation of the way most people understand what justice is. He says, by nature, they say, they meaning most people, to commit injustice is a good, and to suffer it is an evil, but that the excess of evil in being wronged is greater than the excess of good in doing wrong. 
so that when men do wrong and are wronged by one another and taste of both, those who lack the power to avoid the one and take the other determine that it is for their profit to make a compact with one another, neither to commit nor to suffer injustice, and that this is the beginning of legislation and of covenants between men, and that they name the commandment of the law, the lawful and the just, and that this is the genesis and essential nature of justice. It is a compromise between the best, which is to do wrong with impunity, and the worst, which is to be wronged and be impotent to get one's revenge. And he goes on to add, just as they tell us, being midway between the two, is accepted and approved, not as a real good, but as a thing honored in the lack of vigor to do injustice. Okay, so that's the common view of justice. And so then he's going to propose a challenge to Socrates. And here's how he sets it up. The unjust man who attempts injustice, rightly, must be supposed to escape detection if he is to be altogether unjust, and we must regard the man who is caught as a bungler, for the height of injustice is to seem just without being so. To the perfectly unjust man, then, we must assign perfect injustice and withhold nothing of it. But we must allow him, while committing the greatest wrongs, to have secured for himself the greatest reputation for justice. And if he does happen to trip, we must concede to him the power to correct his mistakes by his ability to speak persuasively if any of his misdeeds come to light, and when force is needed, to employ force by reason of his manly spirit and vigor and his provision of friends and money. So what he's setting up here is the perfectly unjust person, the person who has, who in his soul is unjust, but who has the reputation for justice. And then he's going to create the opposite as a comparison, the person who is truly just, but who has a reputation for injustice. When we have set up an unjust man of this character, our theory must set the just man at his side, a simple and noble man, who in the phrase of Aeschylus does not wish to seem, but to be good. Then we must deprive him of the seeming. For if he is going to be thought just, he will have honors and gifts because of that esteem. We cannot be sure in that case whether he is just for justice's sake or for the sake of the gifts and honors. And then he goes on a little further about this just person. Though doing no wrong, he must have the repute of the greatest injustice, so that he may be put to the test as regards justice through not softening because of ill repute and the consequences thereof. But let him hold on his course unchangeable, even unto death, seeming all his life to be unjust, though being just, so that both men attaining to the limit, the one of injustice, the other of justice, we may pass judgment which of the two is the happier. So that's the challenge. He wants Socrates to show him that the just man is the one who is happier, even though it is the unjust man who has all of the social benefits of being seen as just. Well, Socrates loves this challenge. He says, bless me, my dear Glaucon, how strenuously you polish off each of your two men for the competition, for the prize, as if it were a statue. Well, Glaucon is not done yet. He actually wants to, he wants to clarify even more what he means here. He says, the just man will have to endure the lash, the rack, chains, the branding iron in his eyes. And finally, after every extremity of suffering, he will be crucified, and so will learn his lesson that not to be, but to seem just, is what we ought to desire. So kind of a platonic version of Job, right? And then Glaucon goes on to describe all of the wonderful things that happen to the unjust man who has the reputation of justice. Wealth, good marriage, 
even a better place in heaven because he can give more expensive sacrifices to the gods. And he says, so much better, they say, Socrates, is the life that is prepared for the unjust man from gods and men than that which awaits the just. Well, listening to all this was his brother, Edimontus. And by the way, remember Glaucon and Edimontus are both the brothers of Plato. Edimontus jumps in to help out his brother here. He says that he wants to stress here that even when we teach justice as a virtue to our kids, what we really stress is the reputation. He says fathers, when they address exhortations to their sons and all those who have others in their charge, urge the necessity of being just, not by praising justice itself, but the good repute with mankind that accuse from it. The object that they hold before us being that by seeming to be just, the man may get from the reputation, office and alliances and all the good things that Glaucon just now enumerated as coming to the unjust man from his good name. He says, from the heroes of old whose discourses survive to the men of the present day, not one has ever censured injustice or commended justice otherwise than in respect of the repute, the honors, and the gifts that accrue from each. But what each one of them is in itself, by its own inherent force, when it is within the soul of the possessor and escapes the eyes of both gods and men, no one has ever adequately set forth in poetry or prose. The proof that the one is the greatest of all evils that the soul contains with itself while justice is the greatest good. And so one thing that we can read out of this is that Plato is implying that what he is offering in this dialogue is something that had never been done before. So what we're looking for is that it is justice itself, not the reputation of justice, but true justice in the soul that is the greatest good. And so Adimantus stresses do not merely show us by argument that justice is superior to injustice, but make clear to us what each in and of itself does to the possessor, whereby the one is evil and the other good. And he adds to Socrates, you have passed your life, your entire life, in the consideration of this very matter. Right, well, Socrates has quite a challenge in front of him, and he's in a bit of a pickle, really, because there are images in this conventional view of justice which Socrates himself does not agree with. We'll see throughout all of the dialogues that Socrates and Plato do not agree with the idea that you can buy yourself a stairway to heaven. Also, um, they, d the, or say, Platonic metaphysics does not have this idea of good and evil both being realities the way Christianity does. And good is real in and of itself. It's an absolute reality. But evil is not. Ignorance is not. It is just the absence of goodness and virtue. And so this idea that evil in and of itself does something to its possessor implies that some people are inherently greedy or selfish and so on, and maybe that is human nature. Some people believe that. So that's something that Socrates is going to have to argue against. So he's not going to be able to give a very direct um, argument. He has to first undo a lot of these wrong images of the soul and what it is and what justice is. And that may be starting to give you some idea of why this dialogue is so darn long. Well, here's the way Socrates is going to go about it. Oh, sorry. First, he points out that this is really difficult for him. And then we'll see how he goes about it. He says, I do not know how I can come to the rescue. For I doubt my ability for the reason that you've not accepted the arguments whereby I thought I proved against Thrasymachus that justice is better than injustice. That was book one. Nor yet again do I know how I can refuse to come to the rescue. For I fear let it be actually impious to stand idly by when justice is reviled, and to be faint-hearted and not defend her so long as one has breath and can utter his voice. 
The best thing, then, is to aid her as best I can. And so he's going to give us his method. So here's where he's going to set up his analogy of a city-state to the soul so that they can look for justice. The inquiry we are undertaking is no easy one, but it calls for keen vision, as it seems to me. So since we are not very clever persons, I think we should employ the method of search that we should use if we, with not very keen vision, were bidden to read small letters from a distance, and then someone had observed that these same letters exist elsewhere, larger and on a larger surface. We should have accounted it a godsend, I fancy, to be allowed to read those letters first, and then examine the smaller, if they are the same. Quite so, but what analogy to this do you detect in the inquiry about justice? I will tell you, there is justice of one man, we say, and, I suppose, also of an entire city, assuredly. Is not the city larger than the man? It is larger. Then, perhaps, there would be more justice in the larger object and more easy to apprehend. If it please you, then, let us first look for the qualities in states, and then only examine it also in the individual looking for the likeness of the greater in the form of the less. I think that is a good suggestion. So what we're seeing here is that even though the Republic is often taught in universities as being about politics, the building of a city and the discussion of the city is actually only a tool that is being used to describe the individual. You know, we've already seen a few hints from the from the uh, quotes that I showed you already, that they're looking for justice in the soul. For Socrates, the essence of the person, of humans, is our soul. And so when he talks about the individual, he's really talking about the soul, and that'll become even clearer as we go on. So the city-state to the soul is our analogy. We're not actually focused on the city. And this means a few things. First of all, obviously, that's just not what the dialogue is about. It's not about politics. But also, he's going to build the city in a way that says what he wants to say about the soul, which means it may not necessarily be the best, the best city or the best um, political situation. If you were thinking about politics, this may not be the city that Plato would have built. He's only using this as an analogy to the soul. Everything he says about the city, we have to apply to the soul. And since he knows what he wants to say about the soul, he's going to build the city in a way that reflects that. He's also only going to pick things about the city that he wants to say about the soul, or that have some analog, I should say, that he wants to say about the soul. And so it is wrong to think that what he's building is necessarily an ideal city-state from a political perspective. All right, he's going to go on with the origin. The origin of the city, then, in my opinion, is to be found in the fact that we do not severally suffice for our own needs, but each of us lacks many things. As a result of this, then, one man calling in another for one service and another for another, we, being in need of many things, gather many into one place of abode as associates and helpers, and to this dwelling together we give the name city or state, do we not? Okay, now, here's an example of a place where it actually doesn't matter if this applies on the political social scene. We can make many arguments for other explanations for the origin of a city. Maybe, for example, the real reason humans first gathered together is because we had carnivorous animals chasing us and wanting to eat us. Maybe this was a way of protecting ourselves. So you can make other arguments. Maybe it's just because we give birth to one another, that, and maybe there's some connection that we feel to our children and we need to raise them. They're not like, they're not the kind, humans are not the kind of animal that can just uh, grow on its own right from birth or from a very early age. And so there are many different arguments you can give for the origin of how cities come together. The thing is, it doesn't actually matter because that's not what Plato's really focused on. He's not trying to make a real case for the origin of a city. What he wants to do is set up the conditions to talk about these associates and helpers. 
because when he's going to set up the city state, we're going to look at each element in the city and it has an analog in the soul. It won't be obvious right away, but we want to just hold on to these. You're going to have a lot of back burners in your mind where there's a lot of things on the back burner you're going to be holding on to. So we're going to start with associates and helpers. He says, come then, let us create a city from the beginning in our theory, in our theory. Its real creator, as it, as it appears, will be our needs. And so they start their city with just four people. There's a farmer for food, a builder for houses, and a weaver, weaver excuse me, and a cobbler for our clothes and our shoes. And then he asks, what of this then? Shall each of these contribute his work for the common use of all? I mean, shall the farmer, who is one, provide food for four and spend four full time in toil on the production of food and share it with the others? Or shall he take no thought for them and provide a fourth portion of the food for himself alone in a quarter of the time and employ the other three quarters, the one in the provision of a house, the other of a garment, the other of shoes, and not have the bother of associating with other people, but himself for himself mind his own affairs? Edimontus says, but perhaps, Socrates, the former way is easier. It would not by Zeus be at all strange, for now that you have mentioned it, it occurs to me myself that to begin with, our several natures are not alike, but different. One man is naturally fitted for one task and another for another. This idea of being naturally fitted for a task, by the way, has come up in other dialogues, such as the Cratylus, so it may be another thing you want to hold on to. So then their city grows. If each person does only their one task, it means the farmers are only growing the food. So they're going to need people to make the plows and the other equipment that they use. The builders are not going to make their own equipment and their own materials. So they're going to need smiths and other craftspeople. Um, we're also going to need a marketplace then to sell and to buy all these things products, which means we need merchants and shopkeepers. And so our city is getting bigger. It goes on like this for a while. And then Socrates asks, has our city then, Adimantus, reached its full growth? And is it complete? Perhaps. Where then can justice and injustice be found in it? And along with which of the constituents that we've considered, do they come into the state? I cannot conceive, Socrates, unless it be in some need that those very constituents have of one another. So from here, then, Socrates is going to describe this healthy city-state. The healthy city-state, of course, is analogous to the healthy soul. He describes it as a very simple, modest life. And here's just a small excerpt from that description. Will they not make bread and wine and garments and shoes? And they will build themselves houses and carry on their work in summer, for the most part unclad and unshod. And in winter, they'll be clothed and shod sufficiently. And for their nourishment, they will provide meal from their barley and flour from their wheats. And he goes on describing this very modest, very simple life until finally Glaucon cuts in. So Eddie Montes had been talking up to now, but Glaucon cuts in, says, If you are founding a city of pigs, Socrates, what other fodder? Then this would you provide. Why, what would you have, Glaucon? What is customary? They must recline on couches, I presume. And they're not to be, un in, I'm sorry, if they are not to be uncomfortable. And they should dine from tables and have dishes and sweetmeats such as are now in youth. So we see here that it's too simple. And this is very much the attitude that many people have about those with a healthy soul as well. Boring people. And that's no fun at all. Nobody can live that way. Well, that's the attitude Glaucon has about the city-state. He wants a more exciting life. And so from here, the dialogue is going to take a turn. Socrates says that it is not merely the origin of a city, it seems, that we are considering, but the origin of a luxurious city. And perhaps that isn't such a bad suggestion either, for by observation of such a city, it may be we could discern the origin of justice and injustice in states. The true state, I believe, to be the one we've described, the healthy state, as it were. So this is the true state, or the truly healthy city-state, the truly healthy state of the soul. But if it is your pleasure that we contemplate also a fevered state, 
There is nothing to hinder. So those who argue that, or who try to make the case that the Republic is Plato's representation of the ideal city-state, we already see that that's wrong on a number of levels. It's not actually the focus of the dialogue to talk about politics, even though obviously there is political discussion in the dialogue. It's not the focus. And even if you are mistaking that analogy for reading it on face value, we're not getting the ideal city-state because that's already done. We're only halfway through book two, not even halfway maybe, through book two, and we're already putting aside the healthy state. And we're going to focus for the rest of the book, and there are 10 books here, we're going to focus now on the fevered state. So Socrates says we're going to have to enlarge the city again. For that healthy state is no longer sufficient, but we must proceed to swell out its bulk and fill it up with a multitude of things that exceed the requirements of necessity in states. As, for example, the entire class of huntsmen and the imitators, many of them occupied with figures and colors and many with music, the poets and their, and their assistants, rhapsodists, actors, chorus dancers, contractors, and on and on. So Plato very famously banned the poets from his city-state. He's received criticism over ages for this. If you read it on face value, yes, that's what he did. But if you understand that this is an analogy and you're reading it as an analogy, then you can look for what he's really talking about. And that's where it gets interesting. So that's a little cliffhanger for next week because that section is going to come up in next week's video. But for now, he's going to go on enlarging the city-state. My throat is dry today. All right. We shall have to cut out a cantle of our neighbor's land if we are to have enough for pasture and plowing. And they, in turn, of ours, if they, too, abandon themselves to the unlimited acquisition of wealth, disregarding the limits set by our necessary wants. There are many ideas here that are going to come up again, books, in, especially book eight, but also book nine. Um, he says a little more about this, but the point I want to um, highlight here is that we have further discovered the origin of war, namely from those things from which the greatest disaster, public and private, come to states when they come. So we've started, we got the origin of war, and now we have to enlarge our city-states even more. Because if we're going to have war, we need to have soldiers, or he calls them here guardians. The task of our guardians is the greatest of all. It would require more leisure than any other business, and the greatest science and training. So we're going to see that for the next few books, the guardians are very important. And so we want to keep track of everything he says about the guardians. And as we go on, we'll get a better sense of what the guardians represent in the soul. But we want to keep track of everything he says about them. It becomes our task, then, it seems, if we are able to select which and what kinds of natures are suited for the guardianship of a state. And so what he's going to talk about now about the guardians is their nature. Do you think there is any difference between the nature of a well-bred hound for this watchdog's work and that of a well-born lad? Rather odd comparison. Oh, what a well-born lad. You remind me of a dog. It's an odd comment, and Glaucon thinks so too. He asks, what point have you in mind, Socrates? I mean that each of them must be keen of perception, quick in pursuit of what it has apprehended, and strong, too, if it has to fight, out with its, fight it out with its captives. Why, yes, there is need of all these qualities. Okay, so the dog comparison is there to give us these certain qualities. Quick in pursuit, keen of perception, strong. And it must further be brave if it is to fight well, of course. And will a creature be ready to be brave that is not high-spirited? whether horse or dog or anything else. Have you never observed what an irresistible and invincible thing is spirit, the presence of which makes every soul in the face of everything fearless and unconquerable? 
I have. The physical qualities of the guardian then are obvious, and also those of his soul, namely that he must be of high spirit. Okay, so high spirit is a very important quality in the soul, he's telling us. Where shall we discover a disposition that is at once gentle and great-spirited? For there appears to be an opposition between the spirited type and the gentle nature. But yet, if one lacks either of these qualities, a good guardian he never can be. So this is another important quality about the nature of the guardians. They must be both gentle and great-spirited, very much like a guard dog, gentle to its master, but very protective when somebody wants to attack the master. And so if we can see this quality in dogs, then surely we can find it in humans as well. So that's the comparison. There's also one more thing he's going to slip in, the love of wisdom. It doesn't really make sense the way he slips it in with on the surface story of the guardians, but it is important about the soul. And so that's why he slips it in. And then he's going to finalize this section of the nature by um, describing it in this way. The love of wisdom then in high spirit and quickness and strength will be combined for us in the nature of him who is to be a good and true guardian of the state. And so that is the guardians. Now from next week, we're going to get into the education of the guardians. And this is really a key part of the Republic. If we're going to look for justice in the soul, justice comes through the education of the soul. And so we have to see how the soul is educated in order to find how justice takes root. And with bad education, of course, injustice takes root. So we're going to see that from next week. And I do hope you'll join me. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below or drop me an email. And I always appreciate a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And please think about subscribing if you don't already, because I do put out a new video each week. So thank you very much. I hope you'll join me next time.